Now turn back uh, with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to focus on this short section that I read this uh, short while ago. We've spent a bit of time looking at Matthew chapter 5, and we've reached chapter 6. And uh, the focus of the passage tonight is, as it says at the start of your chapter there, giving, giving to the needy. And so, as I mentioned again, Jesus, in much of what he speaks about in this sermon, is dealing with ethics or behavior, the way that we behave and the way that we conduct ourselves. And so our focus tonight is on giving. Now, giving is wonderful, isn't it? We love to get stuff, but we should love to be able to give to people. Isn't that a wonderful opportunity when you know that you're able to help somebody? So I want to just say that giving is great. But I also want to say this, that giving is potentially deadly. And what I mean by that is, being able to give, being able to support others or be generous, give alms, as it talks about in this passage here, or in loads of different ways. We can give in many different ways to many different types of people, many different circumstances. Can be, okay, can be, if you like, at the epicenter of our potential to feel self-righteous. And uh, down the road from that, is works righteousness. So that's why I say it's potentially deadly. Giving is wonderful, and we should give. We're called to give. We're called to be generous givers. And in the way that we act and serve others, that's what we're to do. But it's, this has huge potential for us to think, I gave so much this month. Aren't I so wonderful and so generous and such a good Christian or a good human being? God must surely love me more than other people. So that's just something to outline right at the start because it's behind uh, what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is talking to the people who are listening to him and, if you like, the the wider culture uh, as he introduces in verse 1 about what he calls acts of righteousness. And giving is one of these acts of righteousness. So there are three things that he goes on to talk about in the whole chapter. Obviously, we're just looking at the first uh, little section here. Three things that were, if you like, kind of traditional um, act, religious activities. And the first one, as we, we're going to talk about, is giving. And then he goes on to talk about prayer. And then he goes on to talk about fasting. Okay, so these are three things that he talks about, three ways of behaving that Jesus wants to address. And he affirms them. So he doesn't come and say, uh, yeah, this is of the old covenant. Now I want to teach you a new way of living. Not at all. Giving is hugely important. Praying and fasting likewise. So Jesus affirms these things. What Jesus is concerned with is the motivation behind the way that people are giving. And that's what we've seen so much of in this sermon, isn't it? The, the, what's lurking in people's hearts that motivates them in what they do or how they speak or how they behave towards one another. So what we can say, really in sort of summarizing what Jesus says in this passage, is he moves He wants people to think in terms of their giving. He wants to move it from the public to the private sphere because people were doing it very ostentatiously to show off. So he moves that to the private sphere. But if we're thinking about it being in terms of heart motivation, it's always a heart issue, whether you do it publicly or privately. Because that's the issue, isn't it? You could do something privately because you want to be just thankful and do something quietly. But even if you do something very publicly and ostentatiously, that's a heart issue also, because maybe the root of what's going on in your heart is pride. So he's dealing with the heart of the people that he's speaking to. And so it calls us tonight to think, as we apply this and as we go through this short passage and think about it for ourselves, our own hearts. That's where we have to go tonight. We have to think about our own hearts and the way that we act in situations like this. So I want to, just looking at verse 2, just in starting off here, just thinking about the way that Jesus describes what he sees and what's happening. I want to think about giving maybe more broadly, and particularly the whole area of philanthropy. So philanthropy, the, the, the potential of people to be really good humans and love other humans really lavishly and, and, and in a really great way give lots of money, set up foundations, all these kind of things. I think uh, that's a wonderful thing to do, and nothing I'm going to say tonight is going to be against anything like that. 
But again, going back to what I said about the potential for giving to lead us down a, down a dangerous path, but surely to be a philanthropist, particularly a public, well-known celebrity philanthropist, must be even more difficult to deal with as a, as a sinful human being. It came up a bit this week. Maybe it was because I was thinking about this anyway, but I was reading the news a few times. It came up with regard to the Mark Zuckerberg thing, the guy who owns Facebook. Uh, he had the blessing of knowing his, the birth of his first child this week, and he and his wife decided to give away lots of money, which is good. But it was really interesting the way that the media responded. There was lots of debate about the good and the bad of it. And in a particular newspaper I was reading, there was actually a kind of debate between two columnists as to whether what he was doing was good or not. It's really interesting the way people responded to this very high-profile act of generosity. All kinds of motives were called into question. And I read this about Taylor Swift, who's a singer, in case you didn't know. Apparently, she's given some money away recently. And the newspaper article said this about her. Taylor Swift has continued, now the language is really interesting here, Taylor Swift has continued her campaign to be named Pop's most generous person with a donation of $50,000 to the Seattle Symphony Orchestra. So she gave money away, and the way that it was interpreted was a campaign to be named Pop's most generous person. And then it goes on, Swift has been generous with her money before, earning a reputation as Pop's most high-profile philanthropist. Now, I have no desire to question Taylor Swift's uh, motives. What she did in giving money away is a good thing. But isn't it interesting that immediately there's a, there's a kind of slant put on anybody's very public act of generosity like that? You know, does she really want to be seen as a high-profile philanthropist? Imagine yourself just for a minute being the person with a huge bank account, huge bank account, and being the one standing in front, of the, in front of the photographers with one of those ridiculous, massive checks, and you get to write on it your name to X Foundation, half a million dollars. And everybody's taking your photo, everybody can see how much you've given, and it's reported in lots of different broadsheets on lots of different media sites. How hard must that be not to start to feel good about yourself? at some level, in some way, to receive praise and thanks and acclaim for a good deed, which should be done, but when giving like that is done very publicly, and when lots of people know about it, it, it just, it, when we're sinful and our tendency so often is to seek praise and approval and acclaim and to be justified for our lives and in front of our fellow human beings, how hard must that be? Having said that, that's probably not your life, is it? That not many of us here are multimillionaires holding huge checks for charity. So what we need to do tonight is think, okay, there is that situation possible where people can give lots of money, and potentially the, what we're going to look at in just a minute, in this passage, people were being very ostentatious, and they may have been very wealthy. They may have been able to give away lots of money. But how does it affect you, giving, being generous? We need to think more broadly than just the, this being about money and big money and charity donations. In what areas of your life are you able to give? Financially or just practically? Or serving people? Or showing them love? Or showing hospitality, which is an act of giving and an act of being generous to other people? And in what way are those areas specific to you? What ways do they have the potential to make you feel proud? You see, there's always a way in which what we do and the way in which we can act and live ethically can potentially lead us to feel big about ourselves. And you see, that it's important to, th you may think, oh, that's just nitpicking. It's important surely just to give. Just focus on the giving or the serving or the hospitality. Absolutely. And we're never going to say, don't do it, because you might get caught out feeling proud. But we have to be aware of the way that our hearts can lead us astray. And uh, because it's so distracting, isn't it? It's so distracting. Any kind of temptation that makes us look at ourselves and feel good and feel better than other people and think that God will think we're more impressive this week than last week and 
so we are more accepted than we were last week is dangerous. And being aware of that is important. And we see that, as we turn to the passage into verse 2, as Jesus describes these people, these hypocrites. So he's very harsh with them. Jesus is describing people, perhaps, who'd, who'd kind of lost it ethically. And the way they were describing was just, they were behaving, was, was deliberately uh, proud. So, verse 2. When you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. So they were arranging their own press conferences, if you like. If, they were the, if these were the people who were able to give lots of money to the poor, they, were, they loved it. They loved the cameras. They said, yeah, we'll stand here. You ever get, get this on the biggest news channels. Everybody look at us. We are so wealthy and so good. And uh, it was rotten, really, the way that they were behaving and, and the state of their hearts. And they may have been doing it thinking that they were very good religious people, but Jesus exposes them as hypocrites. So hypocrites, the word comes from kind of the world of theater, those who wear masks. They wanted to appear one thing, but underneath they were just another thing altogether. They wanted to appear so generous and so good religiously, but they were anything but. And so Jesus exposes these people and criticizes the behavior and says, be very, very careful of living that way. Because what are they doing? See, think, when we think about it, what happens when, when, they, when they give in this way? They're giving, but they're taking at the same time. They're saying, here, have all this money and give me lots of attention and praise. And so they're giving, but they're accruing at exactly the same time. I guess you could think about it uh, as being like any good chancellor will do at budget time. You know, when the budget comes along, what does a chancellor want to do? He wants to make cuts, and he wants to appear generous at the same time. And what he wants, she or she wants to happen in terms of the, the, the news and the media, is for the good news to get out there, and for nobody really to notice the bad news and all the cuts that they're making. And so really, and quite obviously, because this is politics, the priority is what makes the news. They're, they're seeking to make announcements about the budget, perhaps make some cuts that aren't so well known about, why? So that the news, so that the acclaim or the approval that they get is good. These people were making announcements about their giving and they were performing their giving in order to get. In order to get status. So that the people in their society would rank them high. So that they would feel ranked high. And so that they would feel more justified. And that's the danger of this way of acting. So Jesus exposes this. You see that at the end of verse 2. Uh, don't do this in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. That's what they want. They want to be praised. So there's the warning and the exposure that Jesus gives to this faulty way of acting and giving. What does Jesus say that should happen? Verse 3. Jesus says, but when you give to the needy. So, do give to the needy. You know, he says, when you give to the needy. Uh, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that's quite a famous phrase. Uh, you probably, even if you're maybe somebody tonight who doesn't go to church very often, you've maybe heard that before. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, give discreetly. Give quietly. Don't trumpet it so that everybody can see. Now, immediately, I think, if you take a step back from that just for a minute and think about it, and again, think about the way in which you are faced with situations where you do want to give, and we should give, but the, the, the subtle pull on our hearts is to receive a claim. The question is, how not to seek a claim? how not to give, even subtly in a kind of ostentatious way, uh, how to be able to give without feeling that grasping sense, that craving for our approval that, we often, that can often kind of gnaw away at us uh, so subtly. How do we do that? 
Well, I think behind uh, what Jesus is saying, and when we really think about the way that the gospel changes our lives, and, those, and being those who are followers of Jesus changes our lives, always considering how the gospel changes our lives, is recognizing, first of all, that we're so often tempted to seek or to have the approval of others. That's just a fact, I think. Maybe some of us are tempted by that more than others, or in different ways, but we're so often tempted to receive the approval of others, even before we seek approval from God. But if we think about what Jesus is saying here, and this, this, thinking this through just for a minute helps us think about how we can deal with this. Jesus says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people. Now that sounds on the surface, doesn't it? Like something that we would do to earn points from God. It sounds like talking about kind of works righteousness situation, your works of righteousness. But actually the way in which, and that's actually the way that many philosophies, religions work, isn't it? A religion will say to its followers, prove yourself by your ethics. Depending on how much goodness you've accrued over the course of your life equals your results in your final destiny. The gospel says something very different. Because we know that the gospel says where Jesus is going in his mission in life is the cross. And so the gospel says very differently. Jesus says, I have done it. That fulfillment of righteousness, Jesus says, I have done it. So Christians then, you and I, are people who trust in another's righteousness. We trust in Jesus' finished righteousness. We trust in his finished work. So it can't be then about us accruing act of righteousness because that contradicts the gospel. It can't be about us being as impressive as we can be because that's contrary to what the gospel teaches us. And so our acts of righteousness are to live as Jesus wants us to do, are to follow him and are to behave in a certain way but they're acts of faith. Having trusted in all that Jesus has done for us, having come to the point where we recognize that we can't save ourselves and we trust in Jesus Christ to be our savior, we then follow him because he is the savior, out of thankfulness and out of faith. And so as we go about our ways and go into our different areas of life, And we do our acts of righteousness, we pray and we fast and we give and all kinds of different things, we do so in faith. We do so as those who follow Jesus. And so our acts are acts of righteousness because they're pleasing to God because he asks us to live by faith. And he asks us to follow him as those who've recognized his salvation first and foremost and who then seek to follow him in response. So we don't live if you like, to do Jesus' work for him. We live in response to what he has done. So the gospel changes the way. The gospel helps us to be those who say, uh, thank you, Jesus. You have done it all. And now I want to live for you. It It helps us to not constantly seek a claim. If we give, to go back to the example again of giving, If we give to seek uh, status from other people, we won't really be able to give. We'll always feel the need at some level to get back, that grasping sense of clawing back a claim for ourselves. But if you believe the gospel, if we're people who know the gospel and have it fresh in our hearts, what Christ has done for us and how he's set us free and given us the greatest gift, if we have that fresh, uh, then we, know, we already know that we have the ultimate status, if you like. We're sons of the, and daughters of the king. We're kingdom people. And we're those who simply follow him. And so because of that, because we have that awareness, we're able to give thankfully. And we're able to give quietly, discreetly, if you like, as Jesus is talking about in this passage here. So the gospel really does change the way that we are to give. And that's what Jesus wants us to consider. Now, I want to just point out a couple of things in the passage that may have struck you. They struck me. They may have struck you. Uh, as, uh, you as we read through it together, or as you may have thought about this passage before, two things that come up in the passage. And the first is Jesus' language of reward. 
So we're just going to spend a couple of minutes thinking about the, the way that he speaks about reward. And uh, then also briefly, whether or not what Jesus says is a contradiction. So Jesus says, I think he uses the word reward three times in this passage. In verse 1, he says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people, for then you will have no reward from your father. He mentions it one other time, and then he says it in verse 4, so that your giving may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. You may be a bit uncomfortable with that language, or unsure of what to do it, because we talk about the gospel as Christians as a gift. And so to speak about reward may seem a bit incongruous. I think we learn a few things. We should consider a few things when we think about the language of reward. Because the Bible actually, in the New Testament, speaks, does speak quite a lot about reward. It speaks about the way that we live so as to get the reward or the prize, different ways it phrases it. A few things just to bear in mind when we speak about the reward that Jesus talks of. First of all, again, this goes back in many ways to what we've already been saying. The reward we get as people comes from God and not from men and women. So isn't that the problem? Again, so often, we're often thinking what other people will do for us in terms of their acclaim or in terms of what they'll give back to us or in terms of the leverage we might get from them if we do X, Y, or Z. Forget that. The reward that we need is from God, the one who made us and who knows us and who watches over us and who watches over our lives. And this passage affirms that. The second thing, just to mention briefly, is that the reward that we get from God isn't all now. So that's, that's another temptation for us so often, isn't it? That we want what we want now in life because that's what we think about. We think about what's happening and we think about tomorrow and we think about whatever, physical things, things that distract us, good or bad. So much in the sermon, broadly, is about the now and not yet of the kingdom. So Jesus is saying that he has come as the king and those who follow him are blessed. But they will be more blessed, if you like. They will receive the blessing when he comes again and ushers them into his final kingdom, when he re will renew all things. And at that point only will they know full peace. And it speaks of new, in Revelation of the fact that every tear will be wiped away. And many other things that we learn that the Christian has to look forward to. So, so bear that in mind when thinking about reward, is that being a Christian is to know God and to know his presence. Again, we were thinking about that this morning. It doesn't mean we get stuff. It means we get God, his salvation and his presence, so that we can be those knowing him who give praise to him. That is a fulfilled life. That's a blessing. And there is so much more to look forward to. So there is that aspect of now and not yet when we speak about reward. And fundamentally also, we should say that reward that we seek from God is uh, ultimately, it's not temporal, physical, but it's spiritual. So the Bible does not promise, and we just restate this and affirm it again, the Bible does not promise us things that we want, the lifestyle that we want, the personality that we want, whatever. Whatever way that you maybe are tempted um, to go wide of the mark with this, as we so often are. And so, if we can put it this way, a reward for holiness, for, for seeking Christ and for living in such a way as to follow him, a reward for holiness is not a house, for example. A reward for holiness is holiness. As we are those who follow Christ, again, what do we get? We get Christ. It is our blessing and our benefit to know uh, the Holy Spirit's help in living for him so that we seek to live more holy lives, which should be a joy to us. Isn't it paradoxical if we think living a holy life is boring or it holds us back in some way? So we get holiness in the way we live and in the one that we follow. And of course, that, to dwell with the king, is our ultimate uh, the ultimate thing that we look forward to in the new heavens and the new earth. So think about reward not in terms of the stuff you get, um, but in terms of the spiritual blessing. And that contrasts, just finally, in terms of reward, it contrasts, doesn't it, with what he says he, in verse, the end of verse 2. He's talking about these hypocrites 
who stand up and who do things that they think are really impressive. And he says in the end of verse 2, uh, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Now, I think that really refers to the fact that often show-offs get acclaim. Maybe it is that the people that he's referring to, alluding to in this chapter, received a lot of acclaim. People held them up as really worthy people. But you know, if that's the extent of the reward that they seek and get, then isn't that a poor reward? To live your life looking for the acclaim of other people. When you could have the reward of being a son or a daughter in the kingdom of heaven. And so sometimes what we need to do is actually take our eyes off the things that we think are so valuable and so special and are going to make us so happy and be reminded of the gospel reward that is ours in Christ. So reward, just a few things about what Jesus says about reward and what he's talking about here. Finally, briefly, we're talking, Jesus has been encouraging those who are his followers to give discreetly and privately to do their good works, we broaden it from just the act of giving alms, their good works so that people can't see, so that it's quiet and hidden. But you might be thinking, well, that, that surely isn't that a bit contradictory? Because the Bible also speaks, and Jesus speaks about the importance of uh, being public Christians. Uh, for example, only back in chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Jesus says, let your light shine before men. So that's an encouragement, isn't it, to be those who have the gospel and who let that gospel be seen to other people. And uh, to, to be those who live in such a way that others see their lives and the good that they do. But it's important to read the whole verse. If we read the rest of that verse, we get the point and we get the distinction here. Because the verse goes on to say, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And that really, I would say, is one of the, the kind of key pivotal points of this whole thing when we're thinking about our ethics and the way we behave and the temptation we have so often to seek praise from others is what does that do? It stops us giving praise to the one who deserves it ultimately, who is God. So our lives are to be the, to the praise of his glory. That's why we're made. And that's our ultimate joy so any crazy feeling or desire we have to gather the acclaim to ourselves is mad for a start because we're really, when we are truthful with ourselves, we don't deserve it. But it's so wrong because it denies God of, of the acclaim that is due to him. The way that we live is to be a reflection of thanks for what he has done for us and is to point people to him not to point people to us. Jesus has changed my, my life, and now look at me, I'm so good. And aren't I wonderful now that Jesus has changed my life? Is the wrong way to think. And so the key uh, is to recognize that um, we are to be those whose lives shine for Jesus, to let the gospel shine out from us. Public acts of good are unavoidable and are um, a great blessing. The point is, where do we want the glory to go? Where do we want the blessing to go? The, the reason I read from the passage in Acts, you remember what the, the healing that was done there. The person who was not able to walk was healed, and he stood up and walked, and he leapt into the temple, praising God. And that's the point. Praising God. And that was the desire of the apostles, that when they healed him, he would give praise to God. And that should always be... Um, our, de our desire. Uh, I read this statement from John Piper this week. He, uh, speaking about ethical living, he says, the greatest ethical challenge is so to live that men and women don't glorify you for living that way, but God. So there's the, there's the challenge and the call for us when we think about ethics, Christian ethics, living, daily life, however it is that you will be uh, um, given opportunity and challenged this week. And as we finish, and as we move towards uh, our uh, time of communion, where we can celebrate the Lord's Supper together, when we think about this feast, uh, 
communion and this, this Lord's Supper, this feast that we can celebrate together. I want to say it's very different from one example of giving that our society often throws up, and that is these, the kind of, uh, if you think about a kind of celebrity charity ball or whatever, which again are good. I don't want to criticize or question people's motives at all, but you know what I mean, these, these great occasions where a ballroom is hired out and lots of people arrive and there's a, it's for a good cause. And maybe the way that people give is by auction and they bid for certain things, or maybe they just make donations. All good. But the tension, I think, with a, an evening like that is the temptation for it to be about the givers. And so people arrive in limos, and they walk up a red carpet, and they come obviously wealthy, and um, they look great in all their finery, and then they give away their money, which is good. We don't come to this feast, this Lord's Supper, as those who bear their own righteousness and their goodness and their worthiness and um, to impress each other. We come as those who have received, and this I think goes back again to, to the whole way in which we change our thinking about how we give. We come as those who have to recognize that they're poor. So they're spiritually, we are spiritually poor. But we have received the greatest gift. And because of that, we give thanks and we remember our Savior Jesus and all that he has done for us. And then in turn, we allow him to change the way that we are motivated and we desire to serve others and to give and to share out of thankfulness and quietly. So there's no room for pride. We're the recipients of God's grace, and that's good news for us tonight as we celebrate the Lord's Supper tonight. The, the words of that hymn, I think, are relevant. Nothing of myself I bring, simply to the cross I cling. So I pray that would be our prayer together as we move towards this time of communion. Amen. Let me just pray, and uh, then we'll move on. Father, we ask just now that you would Bless your word to us. I pray that your spirit would um, do the work that is necessary to apply it properly to us, that you would help us to move on in our Christian lives and to learn and to grow. Lord, we do pray that we would give you all the praise. Help us to do that now in Jesus' name. Amen.